Cool. All right. Well, let's get started. So we introduced ourselves. We're just going to do some general HR housekeeping or some things I like to say, just clean up on aisle HR so that you don't have to worry about these things uh, moving into 2024 and can really focus on the business that you're in or doing some things that are a little bit more fun than um, auditing or checking or rewriting policies. And then as um, and then we'll go into some new laws for 2024. And then as CJ mentioned, he'll talk about kind of the practical application and what he's seeing from an employment and legal space um, in the California court. So we will focus on California here. As many of you know, California is probably one of the most, um, the strictest states, maybe uh, next to New York. So if you do have operations in other states, I'm sure you can find some of this applicable there, or at least know the right questions to ask if it does impact you in another state. Um, so if we want to go to the next... So what I how I like to start out, and CJ, Natalie, and I have had a lot of discussions um, about this, is you'll find all flavors of HR and uh, employment attorneys. Um, what we like to hang our hat on is really getting practical and giving real life examples of what HR can do for your business versus being kind of that wet blanket or police officer within an organization. So I like to say that um, I, I understand the business goals and I try to integrate HR and em employment law within that uh, versus using corporate jargon to just tell you what to do. It's This is a partnership and this is how your appetite for risk and how you can apply these things so that you don't have to think about them and can focus on your business. All right. So this is clean up on aisle HR. Not every organization um, needs a bunch of cleanup, but it's just some really, really good things to keep in mind as you move towards the end of the year and into the new year. So I want to make sure that um, you know you guys all have an update on this, and this will look different depending on the size and shape of your organization, what you have going on, et cetera. Uh, but one of the really uh, one of the really important things to keep in mind is that HR handbook or policy review. Um, so what does your HR handbook look like? What are the things that need to be updated? Now's a really, really great time to take a look at that, understand um, understand what it says, look through policies like PTO and holidays and those things that change from year to year, and maybe some of those burning things that you've been waiting to change because the new year is just a really good time to do it. Um, another question we get a lot with employee handbooks or policy reviews is, do I have, I just had my employees sign it. Do I have to have them re-acknowledge the handbook? Um, the short answer is no, you don't. Um, is it good practice? Yeah, there, yeah. There's, there's a good practice around having employees acknowledge it. But I think what's more important than that is really good communication around what's changing, why it's changing, and then helping um, employees understand uh, what's behind it. So that's, that's one thing that's really, really important that way you don't get into the new year realizing that, oh shoot, I should have changed this because there's an impact that I have to now go clean up. Hand in hand with that is employment law posters. These are really, really easy to order online. Um, there's a few different vendors out there that will do this. You can even get yourself on a subscription basis. Um, some of the, if any of you are on any type of PEO, sometimes the PEOs provide this as a service. Um, but the subscription is really nice because you can select the locations you're in. And then anytime there's an update, they'll just automatically send it to you. So you don't have to even think about it. The next thing is this, the new I-9 form. So the new I-9 form, um, this is, this came out or was released on November 1st. There isn't a ton, a ton of changes. It really just looks and feels a little bit different, but in terms of the document, that the information that it's capturing, um, it's really very similar to the past. Um, this is something that many HR systems do um, and, and integrate with E-Verify if you have that. Um, but it's really important now that you're still verifying the documents live and in person. 
We have remote workers. There's um, a process for that. And if you uh, over COVID, if you were verifying remotely, there is a new process to ver to re-verify those documents. So just really something to know. Um, I and CJ, I'm not sure if this is still a thing, but I nine audits for a while were like the the government was hot and heavy on those. Oh, I think you're on mute, CJ. Sorry about that. Yeah, it comes and it goes. I, I, I think it's something, it's one of these things that you need, I, I would require to be compliant with because some, uh, you know, some state, uh, you know, some administrations are more strict on that when it comes to the Biden versus administration versus Trump. So I, I just make sure you're up to date on that because they kind of sneak in every once in a while and they kind of do it en masse. So got it. Not lately, but there, it could change. So just, be, be aware of that because that's a really important issue. Great. Um, so another topic here is really the review of your HR file. So however you capture information, and this is something we'll be sending out to each of you after this call, um, is just like what to put in an HR file and what not to put in an HR file if you're curious about that because there are things that you want in there and there's things that you don't want in there. Um, but if you have electronic files, taking a look, doing just an audit of what, what you have going on going into the new year, and then any employee documents. So team members can should go into, if you have an HR system or however you're collecting their information to make sure their addresses are updated, their tax information is correct. The last thing you wanna do is get into the new year only to realize their tax information was incorrect. I've had this happen. And the process to change those things from an employer standpoint and an employee standpoint is complicated and expensive. Um, and then when W-2s go out, you'll have the right address on file. Beneficiaries are always a good thing to remind your team members to look at on an annual basis to make sure nothing has changed. Um, and then sometimes marital status changes or the birth of child or something like that that impacts taxes. So uh, it's just good, a uh, good thing to do on an annual basis. Um, Another thing is ensure that required training. So all of this that I'm talking about is feels a bit like a checklist and really it is um, to make sure that you're set up for success moving into the new year. Again, it's just like a good annual reminder. Um, ensure the required training has been completed and documented. So for California, sexual harassment training is a big one. Um, for some of your industries, there's other required trainings that are out there. So looking at that, if you have you know, how you're, how you're completing it, how you're tracking it, and then make sure that it's completed. This is another really big one. Um, Christy, can I just add one thing on the training real quick? Of you course. Mind? The sexual harassment training is really important because that's the first, one of the first requests we get in a harassment related litigation case. Have you provided training? When did you provide training? Did this manager that's being alleged to have conducted some wrongdoing or done some wrongdoing, does he or she have training? These are things that are not just important from a, you know, from a, from a baseline, a structural standpoint of how do we run our HR department, but it has a serious impact in litigation as well. So those are one of those things that you don't want to miss out on because you want to have it locked up so that if you are in that position in litigation, the answer is yes, here it is. Here's what it was. Awesome. Thank you. And here's another big one. I think uh, companies often fail to take a look at this, but it is a big deal is um, wage statements and required info on wage statements. So most organizations, I think default to, oh, my payroll vendor knows exactly what to put on there and I trust that they have it. I would just recommend that you take another glance at it um, to make sure that it actually is inclusive of all the information that's required to be on a wage statement. So I'm going to go through it. It's a, it's there's nine things that should be on there. Um, so employee name and the last four digits of their social, or an employee ID number, whatever you're using. Um, what pay period the pay the statement is for? The gross wages without deductions for the pay period the total hours worked by the employee, a breakdown of regular versus overtime hours, 
all deductions, tax withholdings, 401k, benefit deductions, anything like that, their net wages, the name and address of the employer, and then the amount of sick leave and vacation the employee has accrued. I see a lot of times that last point that I mentioned falls off the wage statement for some reason. I, I don't know why. I don't know if there maybe isn't a tie-in from you know how you're tracking um, sick and vacation time to the wage statement, but I find that if a wage statement's going to be missing something, that's usually what's missing, and it's really important to make sure that it's on there. And hey, Chrissy, can I just make a point here too? Um, I, I see some friends on here that like Griff that have heard me talk about this before, but this is a very important issue for legal compliance. Plaintiffs' lawyers are constantly looking at wage statement violations because it is an easy proof uh, proof of liability of wrongdoing to establish your liability. If it is not, if one of those nine items are not included. It is per se illegal. It's a violation. It could lead to a class claim, class action claim. It could lead to a PAGA claim. And they're pretty significant penalties. Even if it's just, you know, a misnomer here or, oh, I just forgot or it's on a different document. And to point back to what Christy said about your payroll personnel, the payroll industry, hope nobody from payroll is on here. I'm not talking badly about you, but the payroll industry has lobbied very significantly to, to, be, to absolve themselves of any liability. So if your payroll company messes up your payroll statement, you can't sue them. You can't say, well, you're also liable for the wage, the wage class action I just I just filed or served with or that I settled. So you have the ultimate responsibility of making sure the information that you provide your payroll provider is correct and to double check it when it's finalized. Because at the end of the day, the company is going to be responsible, not the payroll provider. And this is the first thing that plaintiff's lawyers usually look at, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is when they do a document demand before they file a lawsuit or make a claim, they're asking for the payroll records. So they're going to be looking at them as a basis for what claims they're going to bring. So probably out of all of these things that we're talking about in the cleanup, this is the one that you should probably focus on the most and make sure it's compliant. Sorry, just wanted to put that point in there. Oh, I love, I love that you're jumping in because that's an important point to make because that's the practical application of how it's showing up for employers. So, um, awesome. Okay, so the next thing uh, is the minimum wage increase for 2024. So the minimum wage at the state level is increasing to $16 an hour. Um, and I want to be clear that there are certain cities and counties that have minimum wages higher than the state minimum wage. So if you're operating, um, especially in the Bay Area, so if you're operating in different areas of California, please just make sure that you check the local cities um, and counties to ensure that there isn't some other type uh, or some other uh, wage that you should be paying your people in that area that work specifically in that area. Um, and then in correlation with this is the salary exemption threshold. So for those of you who have exempt employees, um, the, the salary exemption threshold is twice the minimum wage annualized. So this coming up year, it is $66,560. And this is at the state level. So it's for, it doesn't vary by, um, city and County. It's just one exemption. Um, salary exemption number. Uh, so this is, um, there's all kinds of um, information, I'll say, and legal implications of how you pay employees, especially those that are exempt because they're exempt from overtime. Um, so if there's, this goes into a deeper analysis on the on a duties test. Uh, but if you have any questions about that, we can save that for the end, or you can always reach out to CJ or myself or Natalie to talk through exemption. Um, I'll I'll use air quotes. Um, the safest way, <laughs> if there is a safe way to pay someone is hourly, right? Um, that also has its own implications of ensuring that you pay for overtime, ensuring that people are clocking in and out, taking the necessary breaks, et cetera. So it's not easy. And there are things that get in the way of that, but this exemption um, and the duties test can get pretty complicated. And there are different things to consider when you're looking at how to pay somebody. But it's really- and and, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to 
I, I want to say one more thing before you went on to the next one, Christy. This is CJ again. Um, the importance of what she said can't be understated because when the minimum wage goes up every year, that salary exemption, that salary minimum goes up. And a lot of companies just, hopefully not you guys that are here, but a lot of people just don't understand that or don't follow it or don't, or don't modify it. And the downside is the legal ramifications are it eliminates the exemption. So even if your duties are exempt, if the salary is not exempt, the exemption doesn't exist. So think of what that looks like for back pay. All the overtime that was worked is now owed overtime and liquidated damages as an associated penalty of overtime. The meal and rest breaks, which may not have been provided or authorized and permitted for exempt employees are now owed as a premium for every day. So these are the things that can kind of spiral out of control, which lead plaintiff's lawyers to focusing on the class claims or PAGA claim, trying to mean multiple multiple plaintiffs or multiple class members or multiple aggrieved employees and in, in, in taking it from a one or two person case to a, to a multiple person case. So it's really important that that, that that salary structure is followed properly or else the exemption no longer exists. Thank you. Sorry, thanks. And then the last thing I have here is just time off balances. So in California, you know, PTO or vacation that's given in a in a bucket is wages earned. And so you want to make sure that your time off balances are correct. The policies within whatever system you're using are set up correctly. Natalie and I have recently run into this where um, we were utilizing a system with a client and the policies in the system were set up incorrectly, which then translated to the accruals being incorrect, which then translated into carryover rules being incorrect. And so in California, if those are higher than what you intended, you can't pull back because those are wages earned. So it's just really, really important to look at what are your time off policies um, what are your carryover rules? Is your system accruing correctly? Do the balances look right, true and correct to you? And if not, setting those up um, to be corrected uh, for the new year or moving forward. Um, another thing that we'll get into is um, sick time and changes to sick time. Um, but yeah, these are uh, some of the cleanup you want to make sure that you're reviewing uh, headed into the new year. We'll wait for Q&A at the end. So Natalie is now gonna go into some of the upcoming laws for 2024. And CJ, jump into any of these too. Um, sure. Yeah, so these are just some things to keep on your radar, um, especially when you're looking at your handbook, just to make sure that your policies are compliant with these updates if they are impacting you. So one of the ones um, is the marijuana drug testing update. This doesn't apply to everybody. So if you're in building or construction trades or like a government contractor, government industry, um, it might not apply to you, but it does um, prohibit employers for discriminating against a person that's using cannabis off the job and away from the workplace. So something to keep in mind, um, looking at your drug tests, looking at what kind of tests there are, because they do require now that you have non-psychoactive cannabis um, drug tests. If you're not in one of those industries that um, this isn't applicable to. So it's important to look at your policies, make sure they're compliant with this, and then also look at your drug tests to make sure that they're they're also testing for the right things. Um, the next thing is California has a new reproductive leave. So this is going to be effective January 1st if you are an employer with five or more employees. And what it does is it offers five days off. It, they don't have to be paid. You can pay them if you want to. Um, but it does provide leave for if somebody does experience a reproductive loss and they have examples of like what's covered. Um, some of them are an adoption not going through, a miscarriage. Um, there's a few other items on there, but something to keep in mind and make sure that if you do have five or more employees that you're offering that to your team. Um, another one that Christy was kind of mentioning before was the California sick leave update. So it was previously three days effective January 1st uh, next year, it's going to be five days. Um, how it accrues or whether you do a lump sum, there's two options of how you can do it. Um, so just look at your policies, make sure that whatever method you decide to do, whether it's an accrual method or a lump sum method, it's compliant with the five days that they're um, requiring starting January. Um, the other one to keep on your radar, this one isn't effective until July uh, next year, but something to keep on your radar is um, all employers are required to have a workplace violence prevention policy. 
So we're hoping that as it gets nearer to July, that they'll roll out some sort of like template or policy, the state will, like they did with COVID. Um, we haven't seen anything come out yet, but it might be good to like calendar for maybe January, February next year to have on your radar to see if there is a template available. If there isn't, then um, Christy, I, or CJ are more than happy to help you guys work through that too. This is something, uh, and then this just, oh, just, just to chime in a little bit, this is something that, you know, I think California is notorious for doing this is kind of pushing something out and then pulling it back with more strict details around it. So the guidance is, it's pretty vague and the guidance isn't quite out there yet of like what needs to happen or what needs to be in place. I understand we do have several months before we get there, but um, to Natalie's point, uh, as we receive more guidance, we'll start to send out more information. Um, and we're hoping to get more of that uh, so that you don't spin your wheels creating something that might not be exactly what's uh, required. Thank you. And then this last one is um, California's ban on non-compete or non-solicitation agreements with um, employment outside of California. So if you are an employer and you have employees in other states, um, the non-competes or non-solicitation agreements are not enforceable. Um, they are becoming less and less enforceable. So it's best to get legal counsel on these just to look at your wording and make sure that it doesn't negate the whole agreement altogether. So CJ, I don't know if you have anything to add to that one. You're on mute. I know. Sorry, I'm on mute. Yeah, this is something that's been developing over time. As, as many of you know, California has a pretty strict prohibition on non-compete uh, clauses or provisions in any type of employment contracts unless Let's say I'm buying out Christie's company and I'm buying her goodwill and I'm buying out her non-compete that she has to work for me for five years and I give her X amount of money for it. That's really the only exception that's left. And that's kind of been the same for about 10 or 15 years. But for the past five to eight years, we've been having a, a, a change in the, in the legal, in the actual case law that have been pushing back similarly against non-solicitation agreements for employees or anything. And, and generally, California's position on it is we don't want to stifle competition. We don't want to prevent an employee from either the one that's being soliciting or the one, the solicitee. <laughs> or one that's in an employment agreement that you can't compete in a, in a similar area against the company you used to work for is so that they can, they can avoid these anti-competitive provisions and language that may have chilling effects on somebody saying, well, I have this agreement. I'm, I'm scared to go out and get another job. It's been developing over time and it's part of the business and professions code, but now they're, they're, they're codifying it. And, for years, it was always like, well, there's really no teeth to it because we're not, if we don't enforce it, it's not really a violation. Well, now it is. If it's in your agreements, it's a violation and the state can either audit it or private party can bring it potentially even as like a PAGA claim. So something to look out for. This is something I would probably discuss with your, with your legal counsel, either in-house or outside, just like making sure that those things aren't in, in any of your, in any of your client contracts or employee contracts or even client contracts that may impact the employees, which is kind of the gray area. Awesome. All right, now we're turning it over to CJ and he's gonna tell you the real deal <laughs> when it comes to litigation, employ employer employee litigation in California, the nitty gritty. Yep. So it's all you CJ. Thanks, so I've kind of brought up some issues while we went through this, some of the points earlier, um, as you all know, California is a hotbed for litigation and it's becoming more so now in the past year, year and a half or two years than it's ever been. I've studied this a lot and I've been around long enough to kind of see the trends that after some sort of an economic impact, whether it was 2008's recession and the, and the, and the housing crash and the mortgage industry to even to COVID in 2020 and into 2021, there, these these periods are always follow, followed by increase in employment litigation. You're going to see an increase in workers' comp claims, and you're going to see an increase in, in demands and litigated cases, cases that are being filed. And you can actually you can actually follow these trends. We get some information from an analytic standpoint from the from the court system. The LA County Superior Court is actually the largest court system in the country. And I think as of a couple of years ago, I need to update my numbers. Almost 40 to 45 percent, almost close to 50 percent of the of the cases filed in Los Angeles Superior Court are employment related cases. Right. We have such a, a large employee 
base here in California as one of the you know world's largest economies. And we also have a very aggressive plaintiff's bar that is that is looking for you and your company to mess up so they can bring litigation against you. But one of the things I'm seeing the most of right now is, is what's called PAGA litigation. And if you don't know what this is, good for you that you haven't met with it yet, but become aware of what it is. And, and I'll try to make this kind of concise, but please feel free to follow up with me after this. You have my information's here, or you can ask in the Q and A's, but the private attorney general act or what we call PAGA is a class action type litigation that doesn't have the requirements of certification of a class action. And it seeks to represent similarly aggrieved employees of a company and enforcing not the, the violations of the labor code, but the civil penalties associated with the labor code that for years are only allowed to be recovered by the state of California, but now is allowed to be, since 2004, allowed to be recovered by private attorneys. So the private attorneys are basically standing in the feet of the state to enforce labor and employment violations and recover civil penalties. Now, why, does this, why is this so prolific and, and, and so dangerous? A couple of reasons. One, Unlike a class claim, you cannot waive a PAGA claim in an arbitration agreement. You can waive class claims in an arbitration agreement, but the, the U.S., the, the California Supreme Court, and even partially the U.S. Supreme Court has about that you that it is a function of the state and it is not waivable for a number of reasons in, a, in an arbitration agreement. So because employers got smart and said, hey, let's let's have all these arbitration agreements that have class action waivers, the plaintiff's lawyers have gone from typically filing a lot of class actions to now filing a lot of PAGA actions. Also, there's a attorney's fees provision in there. So the plaintiff's lawyer can recover reasonable attorney's fees and costs at his or her hourly rate. And the most damaging part is, unlike a class action, the employee that files the case only need to have one aggrievement, only one violation in that per So let's say it's a meal period violation or a wage statement violation, as we talked about earlier. And that one violation allows that employee to represent any other similar employee for any violation of the labor code that those employees have. So when this was for, when this first came out in 2004, it was called the headhunter statute. That's what, that's what the fence lawyers like me called it. <laughs> and it's true. And, and, and it is, and it is very punitive, and it is and it, it is it is used to, quite frankly, uh, hijack an, 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 an employer to settling a case, probably for more than what he, the company should. And it is a way to increase the potential violations, not just from an individual standpoint. Remember, we're not talking about John Smith who didn't get ten hours of overtime. We're talking about John Smith who didn't get 10 hours overtime and now a hundred other employees that didn't get overtime, meal periods, business expense reimbursements, rest period premiums. See, so, so see how dangerous this can be in scope. And so we're seeing a lot more of these. They used to be filed always with class actions to kind of pressure the class settlement. Now we're just seeing them as standalone claims altogether. Um, and there's a little bit more nuance to, to it. Like, 75% of what's recovered goes to the state and 25% goes to the employees. But at the same time, we know why these cases are filed because large cases that provide large attorney's fees for the plaintiff's part, that's what they are. So if there's ways that we go about protecting ourselves from these cases, it's exactly what Chrissy just talked to you about, right? Making sure your wage statements are right, making sure you're paying overtime, making sure you're paying, you're providing, um, uh, the new uh, sick leave and that sick leave at 40 hours is now on your wage statement. So all of these compliant think compliance issues are super important to prevent yourself from being in a, in a situation where you get hit with a PAGA case. And now you're like, I got to go to mediation and settle it. I have no other option. And, and, and the way, and Christy and I, and uh, you know, the way we philosophize, I guess, about this is being proactive versus being reactive. Right. So being proactive on how we assemble our human resources department, how we work with outside counsel, how we make sure we audit ourselves every year, even if it costs a little bit more money to make sure that there's no gap 
And that when a case comes in, we're in the best place and we're in the best situation to respond to it. Because when you're at, when you're reactive, it's, it's oftentimes too late. So that's why these little things that we're trying to educate you on and, and, and allowing ourselves available for follow-up is to say, hey, look, at making sure these things, we're putting a little more time into these basic things, it pays off in the long run when one of these when one of these cases come, or preventing one of these cases from ever coming, which is ultimately the goal. So I'm always happy to talk. I know again, some friends on this call have, have spoken at length about um Christy and I are talking about maybe putting together a PAGA only discussion, maybe later in 2024, a class action or PAGA discussion kind of combination, because we're seeing a lot more of these cases. You know, I, I, I bet there's people here on this call that have gotten something in the last six months where an employee filed the workers' comp claim and then came back and filed the wage claim. And maybe that's a pocket claim. Maybe it's a class action. Or we're seeing more of these coming because, again, the economic factors and a little bit more aggressive plaintiff bar. So always happy to talk about that. Um, the other issue that's kind of been popular, and I, I, I brought it up a couple of times today, are arbitration agreements. Uh, and there are pros and cons, believe it or not, to arbitration agreements. The biggest pro is what I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, waiver of class actions. So, but again, it doesn't waive PAGA side of it. So if you have a large employee base, you have 50 or more employees, or in the past couple of years, you've had a lot of turnover and you have 100 or to 200 employees, or maybe even 50 to 100 employees. It may be, it may be, it may be with you to have these arbitration agreements. So that somebody can't come and go back four years for an for a class action and try to recover potential violations uh, under the labor code, the arbitration would prevent that. It would require them to only individually adjudicate their case in arbitration. Now, the, the downside to arbitration is California law has developed over time that arbitration can only be paid for by the has to be paid for by the employer and not the employee. Arbitration is becoming pretty expensive. These judges are retiring. Lawyers are going into the arbitration world and they're charging seven, eight, a thousand dollars, seven hundred thousand dollars an hour to be arbitrators, requiring the arbitration costs to increase. So a typical arbitration, let's say a retaliation or wrongful termination arbitration, could cost just the costs of the arbitration process could cost thirty or forty thousand dollars. So it's really important to understand. If you're a lawyer or an HR person, hey, we need an arbitration agreement. Yes, understand the value of the arbitration agreement, but also understand the costs associated with that arbitration because they do get very expensive. And the plaintiff's bar has gotten smart about that, and they've used that as a weapon. Hey, there's an arbitration agreement. I'm just going to file arbitration and make you pay for it. And I'm gonna, now I'm going to negotiate that cost that you would have to pay for the arbitration as part of our settlement. So... I'm ha I'm always happy to have this talk. I'm, I, I really it's, it, it interests me a lot because I, a lot of people just have these agreements and they're not really sure what the implications of them are. So always happy to talk about that. Um, as we discussed with the increase of the minimum wage, we have misclassification, um, both from uh, misclassification of not having the proper um, assessment of exempt based on the duties. Are your duties meeting the exempt requirement? but also the amount, the salary amount. We talked about that a little bit. The misclassification cases can be pretty significant because if it's if an employee that's exempt from overtime works 50 hours a week over a year, 520 hours of overtime, they weren't paid if the exemption's improper. Now you owe 520 hours of overtime at that person's hourly rate, plus potential meal and rest break. So this is still a pretty, um, this is still an area that's being litigated a lot. Um, a lot of times because of the salary exemption is not met, but making sure with your HR people, with your outside counsel, that the duties of your exempt employees meet the exemptions, the duty requirements of the exemptions, and not just the salary part. Um, and um, with all of this, how do I know a lot of this? Not just because I litigated, but I get demand letters on behalf of my clients on a daily basis. I got one last night at six o'clock. The, the the plaintiff's bar is sending out tons of demands. I bet most of you on this call have probably had your company get a demand from somebody called the Abramson Law Group or the Lawyers for, for Consumer and Employee Rights. And they're saying, well, you did all this stuff wrong and pay me $60,000. How are you responding to that? What are you doing? Um, are you just writing them checks? 
So there's some strategy involved in that. Some of these lawyers in these law firms aren't litigating or aren't filing cases. And if there's if you did something wrong and you want to and you want to buy peace, there's there's a way to aggressively kind of resolve those cases at a low amount, or you can just maybe ignore it and sometimes they go away. But I'm sure you're getting a lot of these. So when you get them, you need to have an individual discussion for each of these demands. What is this employee? What was their job? Was there any issues regarding their termination or let go? Were they paid properly? Assessing those issues for each employee when these demands come in and then having, making, being able to be educated enough to make the right decision. And how do we respond to these letters? Do we ignore it? Do we try to settle the case for $5,000 and, and, and move on? So those are all things that are going to be coming across your desk if they haven't already. And something just to be aware of to discuss with your internal HR departments and your outside counsel or your in-house counsel. And then the last thing I'm seeing a, lot, a little bit more of now is... Um, the coming back to the office from the remote work work world, we're seeing a little bit more of a trend of people coming back to the office. And whatever your opinion on it is, one way or the other, I'm not going to get into that. But the issue is there's 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 growing pains with all this, even three years later after COVID. You know, we had a lot of people working remotely that when they went to work remotely quickly, they weren't given expense, they weren't reimbursed for expenses such as home Wi-Fi or printers or printer ink. We all know how expensive printer ink is or cell phone use. And so they had a lot of these wage and hour issues existing at the home at remote work. And now when people are going back to work, we're kind of getting people back in it. And we have to just make sure that our policies are, are, are drafted and enforced in a way to make sure that we're not leaving ourselves exposed to wage and hour issues or um, and, and other, other employment related issues. So um, we're, we're seeing a little, lot more of that coming back. So I don't know how that affects you guys. I think it's everybody differently, but we're, I think still there's a good, part of people that are working remotely, but that's shrinking, I think, by the month. So all of these things kind of in general are what I'm seeing. Um, again, I don't want to scare anybody, but we're at a time where just we're seeing more claims filed. We're seeing more demand letters go. So now is the, is the best time to make sure if you don't have any ongoing litigation, or if you do, try to resolve it and fight it and best of luck with that, right? But if you don't, making sure you're being, again, proactive versus reactive. How can we make sure that our HR policies and procedures, our philosophy is, is in the way we treat our employees is all, we're all on board with that and it's compliant. And so we can minimize the potential of a lawsuit coming in or a demand coming in so that when and if a case comes in, we're prepared to defend it. We're prepared to have a conversation with a, with a lawyer. I actually had one this morning where I said, hey, I, I've been advising this client for a long time. They do their things right. Here's an example of it. And they're like, oh, have that conversation. Maybe that case doesn't get filed or maybe that case is resolved quickly or easily or maybe it's even dismissed. So again, being proactive versus reactive is the best way that I can sum up how to handle these legal issues and just be knowledgeable of, of them and, and, how the, and, and, and how they impact your business. Awesome. Yep. Okay. And uh, there's one thing you mentioned, CJ, that, I, you know, we didn't cover at all in here, and maybe it's a future topic that we, we have um, together, but we're talking about like what to do and how to do it is like a whole separate topic that actually impacts how people react to certain things or mistakes you make within your business. Right. So there's bound to be something here or there that you don't do right. California has so many laws, it's hard to keep up with it. Um, but how you go about like admitting, oh gosh, we did this wrong or how you treat your employees. It's like a whole separate topic. I could probably spend a whole day talking about, to be quite frank, I won't keep you guys here. Yeah. But um, I think that's something important to note too. And, and when you're looking through all of this is how you communicate it out to your employees how you, you know, how you go about changing things that they might see as a unfavorable impact to them. So certainly something we can always talk through, but so uh, let me make, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. And I think that's more of like a cultural issue. That's a weird word maybe, but like how you're treating people, how your culture at the businesses, we have a lot of friends that are kind of coaches and say, well, you know, better culture leads to better employees and more productivity and less lawsuits. But that's a really important part, and I'm happy. Maybe we could put this together in the future. If people have questions about it, we're happy to talk about it because I, I like it as well. It's it's important. Most of the people that file lawsuits, particularly wage and hour lawsuits, do not go to a plaintiff's lawyer and say, "I didn't get my meal period premium." 
<laughs> they don't have that conversation most of the time, right? They go to them, they go to that lawyer and they say, I was treated poorly. I was retaliated against or I was harassed. Now, whether that's true or not is isn't really the issue. The issue is, and that lawyer says, Let me see the let me see your, your wage statements. Let me see that employee handbook. Let me make a demand to that employee under the in the labor code to get the personnel file and to get their wage records. Let me look at those wage records. Oh, they didn't put something on the on the wage statement. Now I have a class action. Now I have a PAGA action. And so by treating these people a certain way and having the right, again, fit culture, you may prevent that conversation from ever happening, which may lead to one of these cases. So I agree with you on that. I think it's a really important part and factor. Awesome. All right, now we're going to open it up for Q&A. So is there any situation that you, anybody has um, a question on, anything that we've covered, any quote unquote hypothetical situation that they may or may not have been dealing with <laughs> more recently that they want just some free advice on? See a question in the chat from Cheryl. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, let me look at that. And you have a non-solicit... Well, uh, while, um, while an employee, meaning they can't take my business as a side business for themselves? Good question. Um, I think that is more of a proprietary uh, confidentiality type issue, if I'm reading it right. So like, you can't take my established business my work product, my customer or client list and use that and go somewhere else. No, they can't. And that fits more into, if I'm reading this right, and if, if I'm not, put in the chat or you can you can even speak up. Yeah. You can still protect you can still protect yourself on those issues if that's what you mean. Yeah. So like we have truck drivers. So you know, are they soliciting our business with our customers to do it cheaper? on the side, something like that. So they're still employed with us, but you know, we've had situations where they're kind of taking our business. Um, yeah, they've got gotcha. these relationships and we're trying to, so I was having them sign like a non-solicit for that particular situation. It's like, you can't take your business while you're employed with us. We understand you may, you know, be a competitor when you leave, but you're not a competitor while you're employed with us. Yeah, no, that's a, see, that's that's an excellent point, and that's a real world issue that's not contemplated by the way that these laws are enforced or created, because that's exactly what happens, right? I think the way you protect against that is maybe having some agreement about solicitation with the customer too. That can be enforceable, um, but again, you maybe don't want to, you don't want to have a bad relationship with the customer or the client. But the, the one of the ways that I've tried to carve it out to be creative is is almost like um, when I'm talking about like when I say proprietary information or, or a company's work product and saying, you know, you can't use that information to go get other work. Now, this there's going to be a lot of gray area here and a strict interpretation of the law says, well, technically they, that person can can do that. But kind of attack it two ways. Under like the proprietary work product, you can't use it. You can't use it for your own benefit. You can't use it to compete with us while you're working. So a lot of employment agreements or policies will have, you can't have any, you can't work at any other jobs, competing jobs while you're working for us. That non-compete is still okay. So um, I think you just want to maybe just revise the way that's written by saying the same thing, but calling it something different. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I have a question from Griff here. Um, yeah, that's exactly what, so Griff's question in the chat was, he was told that when employees go to plaintiff attorneys seeking help, uh, damages for wrongful termination, they're often convinced to file POGA suits instead because the fees and payouts to the law firms are so much higher than the lawyers would normally get for a typical claim. That's exactly what I was kind of talking about, Griff. Um, yeah, that's right. And that's happened forever. Like I said, like nobody goes to say, hey, I was wrongfully terminated. I feel like it's not fair. They say, well, let's file a class action because I'm going to get a third of that. There's 200 people and I can sell this case for a million dollars. I'm getting $333,000. My firm is for an individual claim that may be worth only $5,000 for sure. 
And for years, that was the class action model, but now it's becoming more of, of, of the PAGA action, for sure. And the other thing is with some of these PAGA and class actions and, and wage and hour actions, Griff uh, talked about an EPLI claim, something that may be covered by insurance. A lot of times these wage and hour claims, and this is a whole other insurance seminar we could probably do with a, with a broker but or an insurance company is, a lot of times the minimum you can get is maybe fifty or $100,000 for the cost to defend the case, but they're never going to pay a settlement out for these claims. So they're even more damaging from an insurance coverage standpoint. Like you may pay a lot of money for your EPLI insurance for employment practices, liability insurance. Those, those insurance policies typically, other than maybe a little bit of money for the defense of the case, aren't going to pay for any settlement like uh, retaliation like would. But Griff, your point is right, and that is 100% true. Yes. Let me just add something to it, if it's okay, CJ, because we, sure. we this was brought to our attention as we were managing a situation with a client. The Paga settlement was $750,000. That was the settlement amount. And yeah. the total cost beyond that was well over a million. And when we asked- You mean, like, a, the, you mean like the defense costs, like the actual attorney fees and costs to, to fight it? Right. The settlement that was oh, yeah. agreed to with the state was $750,000. So while I had the the legal counsel on, I asked him to break it down for me. Where was it going to go? And the, your listeners want to hear this. The yeah. amount that went to the employee total was ten grand. $10,000. That was it. That's all the employee that filed the PAGA matter got. And yeah. when the attorney from the insurance company said this, she said, if they would have just stuck to their wrongful termination suit or their EPLI claim, they would have made a hundred thousand dollars. But right. the law firms are not telling the employees that come with a, a case this, they're not disclosing it to them. And they're saying, nope, let's redirect you to a PAGA matter because that is in the best interest financially of the law firms. They're easier to prove because a lot of the issues with a PAGA claim are technicalities where a wrongful termination or retaliation claim, there's a lot of gray area. They actually have a rebuttable presumption to show that the actions against them were, were discriminatory or retaliatory and you can defend it by, no, this is a legitimate business decision that we made. We terminated you because you were a poor employee or you failed your, your sales numbers were low. Those are harder to prove for plaintiffs. The easier things to prove are, oh, just like what Christy talked about, you're missing your sick leave on the on the on the wage statement. So now I'm going to bring that claim. Yeah, you're right. And and in a case like that, if you if you go and you look at and this is a little nerdy and a little inside baseball for me, but if you look at settlement documents for class actions or PAGA actions, all of these law firms are asking for at least a third, sometimes 40% attorney's fees and then costs included as well so like in griff's scenario if you have a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar settlement they're going to claim a hundred thousand or costs and then of that number they're going to claim three to four hundred thousand dollars or attorney's fees and then the rest of that okay so now we're going to be about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars seventy five percent of that goes to the state okay so now we're going to be about seventy five thousand dollars left so they then the employers have seventy five thousand dollars the guy that brought it you get ten the rest of you guys get a couple grand and that's, that's where we are that's what that looks like from an actual practical standpoint. I'll validate it. Your number was almost perfect. The law firm got $432,000. There you go. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So that's that's the reality of what's happening. And, and, and it's important. And that's I'm glad Griff brought this up because it's easy for me as a defense lawyer that can seem jaded or seem like a true believer to say, well, these guys are just bad guys or bad actors. But there's a business mentality behind it. They know what they're doing and they know what the value of these cases are, which are why they are more prolific and prevalent now. And if I can just chime in from my HR perspective, these things are easy, easy to fix inside, right? So it's like if you're tighter on the wage statements, if you're tighter on um, how you pay your employees, if you're they're 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 harder for the PAGA people to come in and say, oh, you did this, oh, you did that, right? Because if you're tighter on that, there isn't as much exposure or vulnerability of the organization. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And how you treat your employees, right? 
that's that's a whole yep. other whole other position. Yep. Yeah, those are those are two Cheryl and Griff. Those are two really good questions. Both different issues, but I mean, Griff and I have had this conversation separately before. Um, um, another question Griff brought up: How common are labor lawsuit campaign funded by private equity or hedge funds? We've heard rumors of that, and when I talked about earlier the business of being a plaintiff lawyer, it truly is a business. A lot of these firms actually work together. They pool money. They have investors. I'm not sure if it goes to private equity or hedge funds. I bet it does. I bet private equity has pieces of some of these larger firms. Now, the issue with lawyers sharing fees with non-lawyers, that's prohibited. But there's a way I'm sure they can get around it from an operational cost standpoint or some, or you know, or having a lawyer that's part of it, or maybe a, a, a private equity that's lawyer based, that's that's that, that are bar members and that are that have law licenses that can fund that. We're definitely seeing a lot more of that, some sort of a funding, some sort of a united mentality of putting funds together and strategy together to, to fund these cases. That's definitely happening. To the extent of where it's coming from, I don't know exactly, but. You know, you see a lot of it from the, the, you know, if you drive around on the 405 or even I was in Las Vegas for a, a sporting event with my son a couple weeks ago. If you drive around, ever drive around Las Vegas and you look at the signs wow. all around there, what are they? They're other than the casino signs. They're all personal injury lawyers or plaintiff's lawyers or um, employment lawyers or workers comp lawyers. So what we're seeing is an aggressive marketing mentality. At some point, you may say, well, how did that person find that lawyer? And it's because of, of really aggressive marketing, mostly online marketing with SEO optimization and, and, and other issues like how they're helping to be developed by AI. So that, that, the, the, that result and conclusion of all this kind of goes back to Christy, right, saying, being proactive on dealing with these and putting yourself in the best position that if and when it comes, you have a, you're in a better state to fight it and defend it. Awesome. Is there any more questions out there? Any clarification we can provide to anybody? We'll be sending a follow-up to all of you. I mentioned a, a brief checklist that we can send to you. Um, and then it'll have our contact information on there as well. So if anything comes up, uh, let us know, feel free to reach out. And then, yeah, CJ, Natalie, and I will, uh, put our brains together of what comes next. And we'll just continue the series on, um, you know, informing yeah. all of you and helping all of you and operating a business inside of California. <laughs> Thanks, for, all right, thanks, thanks for coming. We really appreciate all of you. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.